Section number zero of the Glories of Ireland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Glories of Ireland, edited by Joseph Dunn and P. J. Lennox. Section zero. Preface. We had at first intended that this should be a book without a preface and indeed it needs none, for it speaks in no uncertain tones for itself. But on reconsideration, we decided that it would be more seemly to give a short explanation of our aim, our motives, and our methods. As a result of innumerable inquiries which have come to us during our experience as educators, we have been forced to the conclusion that the performances of the Irish race in many fields of endeavor are entirely unknown to most people and that even to the elect they are not nearly so well known as they deserve to be hence there came to us the thought of placing on record in an accessible comprehensive and permanent form an outline of the whole range of irish achievement during the last two thousand years in undertaking this task we had a twofold motive in the first place we wished to give to people of irish birth or descent substantial reason for that pride of race which we know is in them by placing in their hands an authoritative and unassailable array of facts as telling as any nation in the world can show our second motive was that henceforward he who seeks to ignore or belittle the part taken by men and women of irish birth or blood in promoting the spread of religion civilization education culture and freedom should sin not in ignorance but against the light and that from a thousand quarters at once champions armed with the panoply of knowledge should be able to spring to his confutation to carry out in a satisfactory manner over a field so immense our lawfully ambitious aim was as we realized at the outset not possible to any two men who are primarily engaged as we are in other work of an exacting nature therefore to render feasible the execution of our undertaking we decided to invite the collaboration of many scholars and specialists each of whom could out of the fullness of information speak with authority on some particular phase of the general subject we are glad to say that the eminent writers to whom we addressed ourselves answered with promptitude and alacrity to our call and have supplied us with such a body of material as to enable us to bring out a book that is absolutely unique from each contributor we asked nothing but a plain verifiable statement of facts and that we think is exactly what they have given us for while we do not make ourselves personally responsible for everything set down in the following pages we believe that what stands written therein bears every mark of careful research and of absolute reliability although on many of our subjects little more remains to be said than what appears in the text yet the treatment on the whole does not claim to be exhaustive and therefore each writer has at our request appended to his contribution a short and carefully selected bibliography so that those who are interested may have a guide for further reading for our part we consider these lists of works of reference to be a highly useful feature it is a glorious thing for us who are proud one of us of his irish descent and the other of his irish birth to think that the sons and daughters of mother erin have so conspicuously distinguished themselves in such varied spheres of activity in every age and in so many lands and that we were privileged to make public the record of their achievements in a form never before attempted we have other works in contemplation and some actually in preparation which will go far to strengthen the claims put forward in this book in the meantime we trust that the reception accorded to it will be such as to encourage us to persevere in making still better known the glories of ireland joseph dunn p j lennox catholic university of america washington d c november nineteen fourteen end of preface recording by april six zero nine zero california united states of america Section number one of the Glories of Ireland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Glories of Ireland, edited by Joseph Dunn and P. J. Lennox, section number one. The Glories of Ireland, a Romance of Irish History, by Sir Roger Casement, C.M.G. The history of Ireland remains to be written, but the purpose of Irish men remains yet to be achieved. The struggle for national realisation, begun so many centuries ago, is not ended. And if the long story offers a so frequent record of failure, it offers a continuous appeal to the highest motives and a constant exhibition of a most pathetic patriotism linked with the sternest courage. Irish wars throughout all time have been only against one enemy, the invader, and, ending so often a material disaster, they have conferred always a moral gain. Their memory uplifts the Irish heart. For no nation, no people can reproach Ireland with having wronged them. When, at the dawn of the Christian era, we first hear of Ireland from external sources, we learn of it as an island harbouring free men, whose indomitable love of freedom was hateful to the spirit of imperial exploitation. Agricola's advice to the empire builders of his day was that Rome should war down and take possession of Ireland, so that freedom might be put out of sight. It was to meet this challenge of despotism that the Scottish clans of Alba turned to their motherland for help, and the sea was white with the hurrying oars of the men of Erin speeding to the call of their highland kinsmen, threatened with imperial servitude. The first external record we possess thus makes it clear that when the early Irish went forth to carry war abroad, it was not to impose their yoke on other peoples, or to found an empire, but to battle against the empire of the world in the threatened cause they held so dear at home. In this early Roman reference to Ireland, we get the keynote to all later Irish history. A warring down on the one hand, so that freedom might be put out of sight, an eternal resistance on the other, so that it might be upheld. It was this struggle that Ireland sought to maintain against every form of attack, down through Danish, Norman, Tudor, Stuart, and Cromwellian assault, to the larger imperialism of the 19th century, when, as Chiri, the historian of the Norman conquest, tells us, it still remained the one lost cause of history that refused to admit defeat. This indomitable persistency this faculty of persevering through centuries of misery, the remembrance of lost liberty and of never despairing of a cause always defeated, always fatal to those who dare to defend it, is perhaps the strangest and noblest example ever given by any nation. The resources of Ireland opposed to her invaders have been unequal to the founding of a great state, but have preserved a great tradition. The weakness of Ireland lay in the absence of a central organisation, a state machine that could mobilise the national resources to defend the national life. That life had to depend for its existence under the stress of prolonged invasion on the spontaneous patriotism and courage of individuals. At times one clan alone, or two clans, maintained the struggle. Arrayed against them were all resources of a mighty realm, shipping, arms, munitions of war, gold, statecraft, a widespread and calculating diplomacy the prestige of a great sovereign in a famous court. And the Irish clan and its chieftain, by the sheer courage of its members, by their bodily strength and hardihood and feats of daring, for years kept the issue in doubt. When Hugh O'Neill, leagued with Red Hugh O'Donnell, challenged the might of Elizabeth, he had nothing to rely upon but the stout hearts and arms of the men of Tyr Owen and Tyr Connell. Arms and armaments were far from Ulster. They could be procured only in Spain or elsewhere on the continent. English shipping held the sea. The English mint the coinage. The purse of England, compared to that of the Ulster princes, was inexhaustible. Yet for nine years the courage, the chivalry, the daring and skill of these northern clansmen, perhaps twenty thousand men in all, held all the might of England at bay. And the Spanish king at any time during the contest made good his promise to lend effective aid to the Irish princes, O'Neill would have driven Elizabeth from Ireland, and a sovereign state would today be the guardian of the freedom of the western seas for Europe and the world. It took the best army in Europe and a vast treasure 
as Sir John Davies asserted, to conquer two Ulster clans 300 years ago. The naked valour of the Irishman excelled the armed might of Tudor England, and the struggle that gave the Empire of the Seas to Britain was not won in the essay of battle, but in the assay of the mint. It is this aspect of the Irish fight for freedom that dignifies an otherwise lost cause. Ever defeated, yet undefeated, a long-remembering race believes that these native qualities must in the end prevail. The battle has been from the first one of manhood against might. The state papers, the official record of English rule in Ireland, leave us rarely in doubt. We read in that record that, whether the appeal was to the strength or courage of the opposing men, the Irish had nothing to fear from English arms. Thus the Earl of Essex, in a dispatch to Elizabeth, explained the failure of his great expedition in 1599 against O'Neill and O'Donnell. These rebels have, though I do unwillingly confess it, better bodies and perfecter use of their arms than those men whom your majesty sends over. The flight of the earls in 1607 left Ireland leaderless, with nothing but the bodies and hearts of the people to depend on. In 1613 we read, in the same records, a candid admission that, although the clan system had been destroyed and the great chiefs expropriated, converted, or driven to flight, the people still trusted to their own stout arms and fearless hearts. The next rebellion, whenever it shall happen, doth threaten more danger to the state than any heretofore, when the cities and walled towns were always faithful. One, because they have the same bodies they ever had, and therein they had and have advantage of us. Two, from infancy they have been and are exercised in the use of arms. Three, the realm, by reason of the long peace, was never so full of youths. Four, that they are better soldiers than heretofore their continental employment in wars abroad assures us, and they do conceive that their men are better than ours. And when that next rebellion came, the great uprising of the outraged race in 1641, what do we find? Back from the continent sails the nephew of the great O'Neill, who had left Ireland a little boy in the flight of the earls, and the dispossessed clansmen, robbed of all but their strength of body and heart, gathered to the summons of Owen Rowe. Again it was the same issue. The courage and hardihood of the Irishman to set against the superior arms, equipment and wealth of United Britain. Irish valour won the battle. A great state organisation won the campaign. England and Scotland combined to lay low resurgent Ireland, and again the victory was not to the brave and skilled, but to the longer purse and the implacable mind. Perhaps the most vivid testimony to these innate qualities of the Irishman is to be found in a typically Irish challenge, issued in the course of this ten years' war from 1641 to 1651. The document has a lasting interest, for it displays not only the better body of the Irishman, but something of his better heart and chivalry of soul. One Parsons, an English settler in Ireland, had written to a friend to say, among other things, that the head of a colonel of an Irish regiment, then in the field against the English, would not be allowed to stick long on its shoulders. The letter was intercepted by the very regiment itself, and a captain in it, Phelim O'Malloy, wrote back to Parsons. I will do this if you please. I will pick out sixty men and fight against one hundred of your choice men. If you do but pitch your camp one mile out of your town, and then, if you have the victory, you may threaten my colonel. Otherwise, do not reckon your chickens before they are hatched. It was this same spirit of daring, this innate belief in his own manhood, that for three hundred years made every Irishman the custodian of his country's honour. An Irish state had not been born. That battle had still to be fought, but the romantic effort to achieve it reveals ever an unstained record of personal courage. Freedom has not come to Ireland. It has been warred down and kept out of sight. But it has been kept in the Irish heart from Brian Boru to Robert Emmett by a long tale of bloodshed always in the same cause. Freedom is kept alive in man's blood only by the shedding of that blood. It was this they were seeking, 
those splendid scorners of death, the lads and young men of Mayo, who awaited with a fearless joy the advance of the English army fresh from the defeat of Humbert in 1798. Then, if ever, Irish men might have run from a victorious and pitiless enemy, who, having captured the French general and murdered in cold blood the hundreds of Kalala peasants who were with his colours, were now come to Kalala itself to wreak vengeance on the last stronghold of Irish rebellion. The ill-led and half-armed peasants, the last Irish men in Ireland to stand in open, pitched fight for their country's freedom, went to meet the army of General Lake, as the Protestant bishop who saw them says, running upon death was as little appearance of reflection or concern as if they were hastening to a show. The influences that begot this reverence for freedom lie in the island itself, no less than in the rote ancestry of the people. Whoever looks upon Ireland cannot conceive it as the parent of any but free men. Climate and soil here unite to tell man that brotherhood, and not dominion, constitutes the only nobility for those who call this fair shore their motherland. The Irish struggle for liberty owes as much, perhaps to the continuing influence of the same lakes and rivers, and the same mountains, as to the survival of any political fragments of the past. Irish history is inseparably the history of the land, rather than of a race, and in this it offers us a spectacle of a continuing national unity that long continuing disaster has not been able wholly to efface or wholly to disrupt. To discover the Europe that existed before Rome, we must turn to the East, Greece, and to the West, Ireland. Ireland alone among Western lands preserves the recorded tradition, the native history, the continuity of mind, and until yesterday of speech and song, that connect the half of Europe with its ancestral past. For early Europe was very largely Celtic Europe, and nowhere can we trace the continuous influence of Celtic culture and idealism coming down to us from a remote past, save in Ireland. To understand the intellect of pre-Roman Gaul, of Spain, of Portugal, and largely of Germany, and even of Italy, we must go to Ireland. Whoever visits Spain or Portugal to investigate the past of those countries will find that the record stops where Rome began. Take England in further illustration. The first record the inhabitants of England have of the past of their island comes from Roman invasion. They know of Boadicea, of Kisavalanus, the earliest figures in their histories, from what a foreign destroyer tells them in an alien tongue. All the early life of Celt Iberians and Lusitanians has passed away from the record of human endeavour, save only where we find it recorded by the Italian invaders in their own speech. And in such terms as imperial exploitation ever prescribes for its own advancement and the belittlement of those it assails. Ireland alone, among all Western nations, knows her own past. From the very dawn of history, and before the romance of Romulus began, down to the present day, in the tongue of her own island people, and in the light of her own native mind. Early Irish history is not the record of clan strivings of a petty and remote population, far from the centre of civilization. It is the authentic story of all Western civilization before the warm solvent of Mediterranean blood and iron melted and moulded it into another and rigid shape. The Irish man called O'Neill, O'Brien, O'Donnell, steps out of a past well nigh co eval with the heroisms and tragedies that uplifted Greece and laid Troy in ashes, and swept the Mediterranean with an odyssey of romance that still gives its name to each chief island, cape, and promontory of the mother sea of Europe. Ireland, too, steps out of a story just as old. Well nigh every hill or mountain, every lake or river bears the name today it bore a thousand, two thousand years ago, and one recording some dramatic human or semi-divine event. The songs of the Munster and Connacht poets of the 18th and 19th centuries gave to every cottage in the land the ownership as well as the tale of an heroic ancestry. They linked the Ireland of yesterday with the Ireland of Finn and Oscar, of Dermot and Grania of Deirdre and the sons of Ushnik, and Cucullan and the Hound of Ulster. The people bred on such soul-stirring tales as these, linked by a language the most expressive of any spoken on earth, in thought and verse and song, 
the very dawn of their history wherein there moved as familiar figures men with the attributes of gods great in battle grand in danger strong in loving vehement in death such a people could never be vulgar could never be mean but must repeat in their own time and in their own manhood actions and efforts thus ascribed as a vital part of their very origin hence the inspiration that gave the name of fenian in the late nineteenth century to a band of men who sought to achieve by arms the freedom of ireland the law of the fenian of the days of marcus aurelius was the law of the fenian in the reign of victoria to give all mind body and strength of purpose to the defence of his country to speak truth and harbour no greed in his heart some there are who may deny to finn and his fenians of the second and third centuries corporeal existence yet nothing is surer than that ireland claims these ancestral embodiments of an heroic tradition by a far surer title of native record than gives to the germans armenius to the gauls ariovistus to the british caractacus this conception of a national life one with the land itself was very clear to the ancient irish just as it has been and is the foundation of all later national effort if ever the idea of a nationality becomes the subject of a thorough and honest study it will be seen that among all the peoples of antiquity not excluding the hellenes and the hebrews ireland alone among western lands preserves the recorded tradition the native history the continuity of mind and until yesterday of speech and song that connect the half of europe with its ancestral past for early europe was very largely celtic europe and nowhere can we trace the continuous influence of celtic culture and idealism coming down to us from a remote past save in ireland to understand the intellect of pre-roman gaul of spain of portugal and largely of germany and even of italy we must go to ireland Whoever visits Spain or Portugal to investigate the past of those countries will find that the record stops where Rome began. Take England in further illustration. The first record the inhabitants of England have of the past of their island comes from Roman invasion. They know of Boadicea, of Cisavellanus, the earliest figures in their histories, from what a foreign destroyer tells them in an alien tongue. All the early life of Celt Iberians and Lusitanians has passed away from the record of human endeavour, save only where we find it recorded by the Italian invaders in their own speech. And in such terms as imperial exploitation ever prescribes for its own advancement and the belittlement of those it assails. Ireland alone, among all Western nations, knows her own past. From the very dawn of history, and before the romance of Romulus began, down to the present day, in the tongue of her own island people, and in the light of her own native mind. Early Irish history is not the record of clan strivings of a petty and remote population, far from the centre of civilization. It is the authentic story of all Western civilization before the warm solvent of Mediterranean blood and iron melted and moulded it into another and rigid shape. The Irishman called O'Neill, O'Brien, O'Donnell, steps out of a past well nigh coeval with the heroisms and tragedies that uplifted greece and laid troy in ashes and swept the mediterranean with an odyssey of romance that still gives its name to each chief island cape and promontory of the mother sea of europe ireland too steps out of a story just as old well nigh every hill or mountain every lake or river bears the name today it bore a thousand two thousand years ago and one recording some dramatic human or semi-divine event. The songs of the Munster and Connacht poets of the 18th and 19th centuries gave to every cottage in the land the ownership as well as the tale of an heroic ancestry. They linked the Ireland of yesterday with the Ireland of Finn and Oscar, of Dermot and Grania, of Deirdre and the sons of Ushnik, and Cucullan and the Hound of Ulster. The people bred on such soul-stirring tales as these, linked by a language the most expressive of any spoken on earth in thought and verse and song the very dawn of their history wherein there moved as familiar figures men with the attributes of gods great in battle grand in danger strong in loving vehement in death such a people could never be vulgar could never be mean but must repeat in their own time and in their own manhood actions and efforts thus ascribed as a vital part of their very origin Hence the inspiration that gave the name of Fenian 
in the late 19th century to a band of men who sought to achieve by arms the freedom of Ireland. The law of the Fenian of the days of Marcus Aurelius was the law of the Fenian in the reign of Victoria, to give all, mind, body and strength of purpose to the defence of his country, to speak truth and harbour no greed in his heart. Some there are who may deny to Finn and his Fenians of the second and third centuries corporeal existence, yet nothing is surer than that Ireland claims these ancestral embodiments of an heroic tradition by a far surer title of native record than gives to the Germans Armenius, to the Gauls Ariovistus, to the British Caractacus. This conception of a national life, one with the land itself, was very clear to the ancient Irish, just as it has been and is the foundation of all later national effort. If ever the idea of a nationality becomes the subject of a thorough and honest study, it will be seen that among all the peoples of antiquity, not excluding the Hellenes and the Hebrews, the Irish held the clearest and most conscious and constant grasp of that idea, and that their political divisions, instead of disproving the existence of the idea, in their case intensely strengthened the proof of its existence and emphasized its power. In the same way, the remarkable absence of insular exclusiveness, notwithstanding their geographical position, serves to bring their sense of nationality into higher relief. Though pride of race is evident in the dominant Gaelic stock, their national sentiment centres not in the race but altogether in the country, which is constantly personified and made the object of a sort of cult. It is worth noting that just that the Brehan laws are the laws of Ireland without distinction of province or district, as the language of Irish literature is the language of Ireland without distinction of dialects, as the Din Shenkus contains the topographical legends of all parts of Ireland, and the festilities commemorate the saints of all Ireland, so the Irish chronicles, from first to last, are histories of the Irish nation. The true view of the Book of Invasions is that it is the epic of Irish nationality. Professor Owen MacNeill in a letter to Mrs. A. S. Green, January 1914. The Book of Invasions, which Professor MacNeill here speaks of, was compiled a thousand years ago. To write the history of later Ireland is merely to prolong the Book of Invasions, and thus bring the epic of Irish resistance down to our own day. All Irish valour and chivalry, whether of soul or of body, have been directed for a thousand years to this same end. It was for this that Sarsfield died at Landon, no less than Brian at Clontarf. The monarch of Ireland at the head of a great Irish army driving back the leagued invaders from the shores of Dublin Bay in 1014 and the exiled leader of 1693, heading the charge that routed King William's cause in the Netherlands, fell on one and the same battlefield. They fought against the invader of Ireland. We are proudly told the sun never sets on the British Empire. Wherever an Irishman has fought in the name of Ireland, it has not been to acquire fortune, land or fame, but to give all, even life itself, not to found an empire, but to strike a blow for an ancient land and assert the cause of a swordless people. Wherever Irishmen have gone, in exile or in fight, they have carried this image of Ireland with them. The cause of Ireland has found a hundred fields of foreign fame, where the dying Irishman might murmur with Sarsfield, would that this blood were shed for Ireland, and history records the sacrifices made in no other cause. Ireland, too, owns an empire in which the sun never sets. References Sigerson, Bards of the Gael and Gaul, O'Callaghan, History of the Irish Brigades. Mitchell, Life of Hugh O'Neill, Green, The Making of Ireland and Its Undoing, Irish Nationality, The Old Irish World, Taylor. Life of Owen Roe O'Neill, Todd Hunter, Life of Patrick Sarsfield, Hyde, Love Songs of Connacht, Religious Songs of Connacht, O'Grady, Bog of Stars, Flight of the Eagle, Ferguson, Hibernian Knights, Entertainment, Mitchell, History of Ireland, in continuation of McGagan's History. End of section one. Section two of The Glories of Ireland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Colleen McMahon. 
The Glories of Ireland, edited by Joseph Dunn and P. J. Lennox. Section 2. The Island of Saints and Scholars, by Canon Dalton, M.R.I.A., L.L.D. Unlike the natives of Britain and Scotland, the Irish, in pre-Christian times, were not brought into contact with Roman institutions or Roman culture. In consequence, they created and developed a civilization of their own that was, in some respects, without equal. They were far advanced in the knowledge of metalwork and shipbuilding. They engaged in commerce, they loved music, and had an acquaintance with letters. And when disputes arose among them, these were settled in duly constituted courts of justice, presided over by a trained lawyer called a brehon, instead of being settled by the stern arbitrament of force. Druidism was their pagan creed. They believed in the immortality and in the transmigration of souls. They worshipped the sun and the moon, and they venerated mountains, rivers, and wells. And it would be difficult to find any ministers of religion who were held in greater awe than the Druids. Commerce and war brought the Irish into contact with Britain and the continent, and thus was Christianity gradually introduced into the island. Though its progress, at first, was not rapid, there were, by 431, several Christian churches in existence, and in that year Palladius, a Briton and a bishop, was sent by Pope Celestine to the Irish who already believed in Christ. Discouraged and a failure, Palladius returned to Britain after a brief stay on his mission, and then in 432 the same pope sent St. Patrick, who became the Apostle of Ireland. Because of the great work he did, St. Patrick is one of the prominent figures of history, and yet to such an extent has the dust of time settled on his life and acts that the place and year of his birth, the schools in which he was educated, and the year of his death are all matters of dispute. There is, however, no good reason to depart from the traditional account, which is that the Apostle was born at Dumbarton in Scotland in the year 372, that in 388 he was captured by the Irish King Neil, who had gone on a plundering raid into Scotland, that he was brought to Ireland and sold as a slave, and that as such he served a pagan chief named Milko, who lived in what is now the county of Antrim, that from Antrim he escaped and went back to his own country, that he had many visions urging him to return to Ireland and preach the gospel there, that, believing these were from God, he went to France, and there was educated and ordained priest, and later consecrated bishop, and then, accompanied by several ecclesiastics, he was sent to Ireland. From Wicklow, where he landed, he proceeded north, and endeavored, but in vain, to convert his old pagan master Milko. Thence he proceeded south by Downpatrick and Dundalk to Slane in Meath, where, in sight of Tara, the high king's seat, he lighted the paschal fire. At Tara he confounded the Druids in argument, baptized the high king and the chief poet, and then, turning north and west, he crossed the Shannon into Connacht, where he spent seven years, from Connachtipest into Donegal, and thence through Tyrone and Antrim, after which he entered Munster and remained there seven years. Finally he returned to Armagh, where he made his Episcopal see, and died at Saul near Downpatrick in 493. St. Patrick wrote two short works, both of which have survived, his Confession and his Epistle to Caroticus. In neither are there any graces of style, and the Latin is certainly not that of Cicero or Livy. But in the Confession, the character of the author himself is completely revealed, his piety, his zeal, his self-sacrifice, his courage in face of every danger and every trial. Not less remarkable was the skill with which he handled men and used pagan institutions for the purposes of Christianity, and equally so was the success with which his bloodless apostolate was crowned. One great difficulty which St. Patrick had was to provide the people with a native ministry. At first he selected the chief men, princes, brehons, bards, and these, with little training and little education, he ordained. Thus, slenderly equipped with knowledge, the priest with his ritual, missal, and a catechism, and the bishop with his crozier and bell, went forth to do battle for the Lord. This condition of things was soon ended. In 450, a college was founded at Armagh, which in a short time grew to be a famous school and attracted students from afar. Other schools were founded in the 5th century, at Nendrum, Louth, and Kildare. In the 6th century arose the famous monastic schools of Clonfort, Clonard, Clonmacnish, Arran, and Bangor, 
while the seventh century saw the rise of Glendalough and Lismore. St. Patrick was educated in Gaul, at the monasteries of Mamoutier and Leran, and, perhaps as a result, the monastic character of the early Irish church was one of its outstanding features. Moreover, it was to the prevalence of the monastic spirit, the desire for solitude and meditation, that so many of the great monastic establishments owed their existence. Fleeing from society and its attractions, and wishing only for solitude and austerity, some holy man sought out a lonely retreat, and there lived a life of mortification and prayer. Others came to share his poverty and vigils. A grant of land was then obtained from the ruling chief, the holy man became abbot, and his followers his monks, and a religious community was formed destined soon to acquire fame. It was thus that St. Finian established Clonard on the banks of the Boyne, and St. Kieran Clonmacnish by the waters of the Shannon, and thus did St. Enda make the wind-swept isles of Arran the home and the resting place of so many saints. Before the close of the sixth century, three thousand monks followed the rule of St. Corngall at Bangor, and in the seventh century, St. Carthage made Lismore famous, and St. Kevin attracted pious men from afar to his lonely retreat in the picturesque valley of Glendalough. And there were holy women as well as holy men in Ireland. St. Bridget was held in such honor that she is often called the Mary of the Gael. Even in St. Patrick's Day, she had founded a convent at Kildare, beside which was a monastery of which St. Conleth was superior, and she founded many other convents in addition to that at Kildare. Her example was followed by St. Ida, St. Fanacha, and many others. And if at the close of the 6th century there were few districts which had not monasteries and monks, there were few also which had not convents and nuns. Nor was this all. Fired with missionary zeal, many men left Ireland to plant the faith in distant lands. Thus did St. Columkill settle in Iona, whence he converted the Picts. Under his successors, St. Aidan and his friends went south to Lindisfarne to convert Northumbria in England, and the ninth abbot of Iona was the saintly Edemnen, whose biography of St. Columkill has been declared by competent authority to be the best of its kind, of which the whole Middle Ages can boast. Nor must it be forgotten that the monasteries of Luxel and Babio owed their origin to St. Columbanus, that St. Gall gave his name to a town and canton in Switzerland, that St. Friedelin labored on the Rhine, and St. Fursey on the Marne, and that St. Cataldus was Bishop of Tarentum, and is still venerated as the patron of that Italian see. And if we would know what was the character of the schools in which these men were trained, we have only to remember that Colgu, who had been educated at Clonmacnish, was the master of Alquin, that de Cule, the geographer, came from the same school, that Cumian, abbot and bishop of Clonfert, combated the errors about the paschal computation with an extent of learning and a wealth of knowledge amazing in a monk of the 7th century, and that at the close of the 8th century two Irishmen went to the court of Charlemagne, and were described by a monk of St. Gaul as, quote, men incomparably skilled in human learning, unquote. The once pagan Ireland had by that time become a citadel of Christianity, and was rightfully called the School of the West, the Island of Saints and Scholars. With this state of progress and prosperity, the Danes played sad havoc. Animated with the fiercest pagan fanaticism, they turned with fury against Christianity, and especially against monks and religious foundations. Erma, Clonmacnish, Bangor, Kildare, and many other great monastic establishments thus fell before their fury. Ignorance, neglect of religion, and corruption of manners followed and from the 8th to the 12th century there was a noted falling off in the number of Irish scholars. At home, indeed, were Cormac and Melmera, O'Hardigan and O'Flynn, and abroad was John Scotus Erigena, whose learning was so great that it excited astonishment even at Rome. The love of learning and zeal for religion lived on through this long period of accumulated disasters. After the triumph of Brian Baru at Clontarf, there was a distinct revival of piety and learning, and, when a century of turmoil followed Brian's fall and religion again suffered, nothing was wanted to bring the people back to a sense of their duty but the energy and reforming zeal of St. Malachy. Gerald Barry, the notorious Anglo-Norman who visited Ireland towards the close of the 12th century, has been convicted out of his own mouth when he states that Ireland was a barbarous nation when his people came there. He forgot that a people who could illuminate the Book of Kells and build Cormac's Chapel could not be called savages, 
nor could a church be lost to a sense of decency and dignity that numbered among its children such a man as st lawrence o'toole abuses there were it is true consequent on long continued war though these abuses were increased rather than lessened by the coming of the anglo-normans and to such an extent that for more than two centuries there is not a single great name among irish scholars except dun scotus the fame of dun scotus was european and the subtle doctor as he was called became the great glory of the franciscan as his rival st thomas was the great glory of the dominican order but he left no successor and from his death at the opening of the fourteenth century till the seventeenth century the number of irish scholars or recognized irish saints was small yet in the midst of disorders within and despite oppression from without at no time did the love of learning disappear in ireland nor was there ever in the irish church either heresy or schism the attempted reformation by henry the eighth and his daughter elizabeth produced martyrs like o'hurley and o'healy and there were many more martyrs in the time of the stuarts and especially under the short but sanguinary rule of cromwell those were the days of the penal laws when they who clung to the old religion suffered much but nothing could shake their faith neither the proclamations of elizabeth and james the massacres of cromwell nor the ferocious proscriptions of the eighteenth century the priest said mass though his crime was punishable by death and the people heard mass though theirs also was a criminal offence and the schoolmaster driven from the school taught under a sheltering hedge the clerical student denied education at home crossed the sea to be educated at louvain or salamanca or seville and then perhaps loaded with academic honors he returned home to face poverty and persecution and even death the catholic masses socially ostracized degraded and impoverished shut out from every avenue to ambition or enterprise deprived of every civil right knowing nothing of law except when it oppressed them and nothing of government except when it struck them down yet clung to the religion in which they were born and when in the latter half of the eighteenth century the tide turned and the first dawn of toleration appeared on the horizon it was found that the vast majority of the people were unchanged and that after two centuries of the most relentless persecution since the days of diocletian ireland was in faith and practice a strongly catholic nation still on a soil constantly wet with the blood and tears of its children it would be vain to expect that scholarship could flourish and yet the period had its distinguished irish scholars both at home and abroad at louvain in the sixteenth century were lombard and cray who both became archbishops of armagh and o'hurley who became archbishop of cashel an even greater scholar than these was luke wadding the eminent franciscan who founded the convent of st isidore at rome at louvain was john colgan a franciscan like wadding a man who did much for irish ecclesiastical history and at home in ireland as parish priest of tibrid and tipperary was the celebrated dr geoffrey keating the historian once a student at salamanca john lynch the renowned opponent of gerald barry the welshman was archdeacon of tuam and in the ruined franciscan monastery of donegal the four masters, aided and encouraged by the friars, labored long and patiently, and finally completed the work which we all know as the Annals of the Four Masters. This work, originally written in Irish, remained in manuscript in Louvain till the middle of the 19th century, when it was edited and translated into English by John O'Donovan, one of Ireland's greatest Irish scholars, with an ability and completeness quite worthy of the original. On the Anglo-Irish side, there were also some great names, and especially in the domain of history, notably Stanhurst and Hammer, Morrison and Campion and Davies, and above all, Usher and Ware. James Ware died in 1666, and though a Protestant and an official of the Protestant government, and living in Ireland in an intolerant age, and in an atmosphere charged with religious rancor, he was, to his credit be it said, to a large extent free from bigotry. He dealt with history and antiquities, and wrote in no party spirit, wishing only to be fair and impartial, and to sit out the truth as he found it. James Usher, Archbishop of Erma, was a much abler man and a much greater scholar than Ware. His capacity for research, his profound scholarship, the variety and extent of his learning raised him far above his co-religionists, and he has been rightly called the great luminary by the Irish Protestant Church it is regrettable that his fine intellect was darkened by bigotry and intolerance 
Far different was the character of another Protestant bishop, the great Barclay of Cloyne, a patriot, a philosopher, and a scholar, who afterwards left money and books for a scholarship which is still in existence at the then infant Yale College in New England. He lived in the first half of the 18th century, when the whole machinery of government was ruthlessly used to crush the Catholics. But Barclay had little sympathy with the penal laws, he had words of kindness for the Catholics, and undoubtedly wished them well. Nor must Swift be forgotten, for though he took little pride in being an Irishman, he hated and despised those who oppressed Ireland, and is rightly regarded as one of the greatest of her sons. The short period during which Grattan's Parliament existed was one of great prosperity. It was then that Maynooth College was established for the education of the Irish priesthood. But Catholics, though free to set up schools, were still shut out from the honors and emoluments of Trinity College, the one university at that time in Ireland. Still, Charles O'Connor, McGagan, and O'Flaherty were great Catholic scholars in the latter part of the 18th century. In the following century, while Protestant ascendancy was still maintained, the Catholics had greater scope. Away back in the days of Queen Elizabeth, Campion found Latin widely spoken among the peasantry, and Father Mooney met country lads familiar with Virgil and Homer. In 1670, Petty had a similar story to tell, in spite of all the savageries of Cromwell and the ruin which necessarily followed. And in the 18th century, the schoolmaster, though a price was set on his head, was still active. With an inherited love of learning, the Irish in the 19th century would have made rapid progress had they been rich. But their impoverishment by the penal laws made it impossible for them to set up an effective system of primary education. And until the national school system came into existence in 1831, they had to rely on the hedge schools. Secondary education fared better, for the bishops, relying with confidence on the generosity of their flocks, were soon able to establish diocesan colleges. And in higher education, equally determined efforts were made by the establishment of the Catholic University under Cardinal Newman. But in this field of intellectual effort, in spite of the energy and zeal of the bishops, in spite of the great generosity of the people, so many of whom were poor, and in spite of the fame of Newman, it is failure rather than success which the historian has to record. Nor has the love of the Irish for religion, any more than their love of learning, been lessened or enfeebled by time. The mountainside as the place for mass in the penal days gradually gave way to the rude stone church without steeple or bell. And when steeple and bell ceased to be proscribed, and the people were left free to erect suitable houses of sacrifice and prayer, the fine churches of the 19th century began gradually to appear. The unfettered exercise of freedom of religious worship, the untiring efforts of a zealous clergy and episcopate, the unstinted support of a people, who, out of their poverty, grudged nothing to God or to God's house, formed an irresistible combination, and all over the country beautiful churches are now to be found. In every diocese in Ireland, with scarcely an exception, there is now a stately cathedral to perpetuate the renown of the patron saint of that diocese, and even parish churches have been built not unworthy to be the churches of an ancient see. At Erma, cathedral has been built which does honor to Irish architecture, and worthily commemorates the life and labors of St. Patrick, the founder of the primatial see. At Turles, a cathedral stands, the chief church of the southern province, statelier far than any which ever stood on the rock of Cashel. At Tuam, a noble building associated with the memory of John Michael, the Lion of the Fold of Judah, perpetuates the name of St. Jarleth. At Queenstown, the traveler going to America or returning from it to the old land has his attention attracted to the splendid cathedral pile sacred to St. Coleman, the patron saint of the Diocese of Cloyne. And if we would see how splendid even a parish church may be, let us visit the beautiful church in Drahida, dedicated to the memory of Oliver Plunkett. Nor are these things the only evidence we have that zeal for religion among the Irish has survived centuries of persecution. Columbanus and Columkill still had their successors, eager and ready as they were to bring the blessings of the gospel to distant lands. In recent years, an Irish-born Archbishop of Sydney has been succeeded by an Irish-born Archbishop. An Irishman rules the Metropolitan See of Adelaide, and an Irish-born Archbishop of Melbourne has as his coadjutor a former president of the College of Maynooth. In South Africa, the work of preaching and teaching and ruling the church is largely the work of Irish-born men. 
in the great republic of the west the three cardinal archbishops at the head of the catholic church have the distinctively irish names of gibbons and farley and o'connell and in every diocese throughout the united states the proportion of priests of irish birth or descent is large nor must the poorer irish be forgotten how much does the catholic church both in ireland and in america owe to the generosity of irish american laborers and servant girls out of their scanty and hard-earned pay they have contributed much not only towards the building of the plain wooden church in the rural parishes but also of the stately cathedrals of american cities and many a church in old ireland owes its completion and its adornment to the dollars given by the poor but generous irish exiles and if the zeal of the irish for religion has thus survived to the twentieth century so also in an equally remarkable degree has their zeal for learning we have evidence of this in the numerous primary schools in every parish filled with eager pupils and presided over by hard-working teachers in the colleges where the sciences and the classics are studied with the same energy as in the ancient monastic schools and in maynooth college which is the foremost ecclesiastical college in the world and if there are now new universities the national and the queen's sturdy and vigorous in their youth this does not imply that trinity college suffers from the decrepitude of age for among those whom she sent forth in recent times are dowden and mahaffey and lecky to name but three and these would do credit to any university in europe it would be difficult to find in any age of irish history a greater pulpit orator than the famous dominican father tom burke or a more delightful essayist than father joseph farrell and who has depicted irish clerical life more faithfully than the late canon sheehan whose fame as a novelist has crossed continents and oceans o'connell was a great orator as well as a great political leader and dr doyle and archbishop john McHale were scholars as well as statesmen and bishops we have thus an unbroken chain of great names a series of irishmen whom the succeeding ages have brought forth to enlighten and instruct lesser men and ireland in the twentieth century is not less attached to religion and learning than she was when clone mcneish flourished and the saintly carthage ruled at lismore references joyce social history of ancient ireland dublin 1903 lanigan ecclesiastical history of ireland dublin 1822 healy ireland's ancient schools and scholars dublin 1896 life and writings of st patrick dublin 1905 bury st patrick and his place in history london 1905 usher's works dublin 1847 reeves adamnan's life of st columba dublin 1851 worsay the danes in ireland london 1852 moran Essays on the Early Irish Church, Dublin, 1864. Stokes, Ireland and the Anglo-Norman Church, London, 1897. Mant, History of the Church of Ireland, London, 1841. Bagwell, Ireland under the Tudors, London, 1885-90. Moran, Persecutions under the Puritans, Callan, 1903. Murphy, Our Martyrs, Dublin, 1896. Meehan, Franciscan Monasteries of the 17th Century, Dublin, 1870. Lecky, History of Ireland in the 18th Century, London, 1902. O'Connell's Correspondence, London, 1888. Wise, History of the Catholic Association, London, 1829. Doyle, Letters on the State of Ireland, Dublin, 1826. O'Rourke, Irish Famine, Dublin, 1902. Gavin Duffy, Young Ireland, London, 1880. Plunkett, Ireland in the New Century, London, 1904. O'Reardon, Catholicity and Progress in Ireland, London, 1905. McCaffrey, History of the Church in the 19th Century, Dublin, 1909. Healy, Centenary History of Maynooth College, Dublin, 1905. Dalton, History of Ireland, London, 1910. End of Section 2 Recording by Colleen McMahon. Section 3 of The Glories of Ireland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Glories of Ireland. Edited by Joseph Dunn and P.J. Lennox. 
Irish Monks in Europe by Reverend Columba Edmonds, OSB. St. Patrick's work in Ireland was chiefly concerned with preaching the faith and establishing monasteries which served as centres of education. The great success that attended these efforts earned for Ireland the double title of Island of Saints and a second Tebeid. The monastic institutions organised by St. Patrick were characterised from their commencement by an apostolic zeal that knew no bounds. Sufficient scope was not to be found at home, so it was impatient to diffuse itself abroad. Scotland. Hence, in the year 563, St. Columcille, a Donegal native of royal descent, accompanied by twelve companions, crossed the sea in carracks of wickerwork and hides, and sought to land in Caledonia. They reached the desolate Isle of Iona on the day preceding Whit Sunday. Many years before, colonies of Irishmen had settled along the western parts of the present Scotland. The settlement north of the Clyde received the name of the Kingdom of Dalriada. These Dalriadan Irish were Christian, at least in name, but their neighbours in the Pictish Highlands were still pagans. Columcille's apostolate was to be among both these people. Adamnan says that Columcille came to Caledonia for the love of Christ's name, and well did his afterlife prove the truth of this statement. He had attained his forty-fourth year when King Connell, his kinsman, bestowed Iona upon him and his brethren. The island, situated between the Dalriadans and the Picts of the Highlands, was conveniently placed for missionary work. A numerous community recruited from Ireland, with Columcille as its abbot, soon caused Iona to become a flourishing centre from which men could go forth to preach Christianity. Monasteries and hermitages rapidly sprang up in the adjacent islands and on the mainland. These, together with the Columban foundations in Ireland, formed one great religious federation, in which the Celtic apostles of the northern races were formed under the influence of the holy founder. St. Columcille recognised the need of securing permanence for his work by obtaining the conversion of the Pictish rulers, and thus he did not hesitate to approach King Brood in his castle on the banks of the river Ness. St. Comgall and St. Canice were Columcille's companions on his journey through the Great Glen, now famous for the Caledonian Canal. The royal convert, Brood, was baptised, and by degrees the people followed the example set them. Opposition, however, was keen and aggressive, and it came from the official representatives of Pictish paganism, the Druids. Success, too, attended Columcille's ministrations among the Dalriadans, and on the death of their king, Aidan Gabran, who succeeded to the throne, sought regal consecration from the hands of Columcille. In 597 the saint died, but not before he had won a whole kingdom to Christ and covered the land with churches and monasteries. Today his name is held in honour not by Irishmen alone, but by the Catholics and non-Catholics of the land of his adoption. There are other saints who either laboured in person with Columcille, or perpetrated the work he accomplished in Caledonia, and their names add to the glory of Ireland, their birthland. Thus Saint Molwag, 592, converted the people of Lismore, and afterwards died at Rosemarkey. St. Drustan, St. Columcille's friend and disciple, established the faith in Aberdeenshire, and became abbot of Deer. St. Kieran, 548, evangelized Kintyre. St. Mon, 635, labored in Argyleshire. St. Buet, 521, did the same in Pictland. St. Malruba, 722, preached in Rosshire. St. Modan and St. Makar benefited the dwellers on the western and eastern coasts, respectively, 
and St. Fergus, in the 8th century, became apostle to Forfa, Buchan, and Caithness. Distant Islands But Irish monks were mariners as well as apostles. Their hide-covered currucks were often launched in the hope of discovering solitudes in the ocean. Adamnan records that Baitan set out with others in search of a desert in the sea. St. Cormac sought a similar retreat and arrived at the Orkneys. St. Molaise's holy isle guards Lamlash Bay off Arran. The island retreats of the Bass, Inchkeith, May, and Inchcombe in the Firth of Forth are associated with the Irish saints Baldred, Adamnan, Adrian, and Columcille. St. Macaldus, a native of Down, became bishop of the Isle of Man. Remarkable, too, is the fact that Irish monks sailed by way of the Faroe Islands to distant Iceland. These sailor clerics who settled on the southeast of the island were spoken of by later Norwegians as Papa. After their departure, they were probably driven away by Norwegian pagans, these Icelandic apostles left behind them Irish books, bells and croziers, wherefrom one could understand they were Irishmen. But St. Brendan, the voyager, is the most wonderful of the mariner monks of Ireland. He accomplished apostolic work in both Wales and Scotland, but his seafaring instincts urged him to make missionary voyages to regions hitherto unknown. Some writers, not without reason, have actually maintained that he and his followers travelled as far as the American shore. Be this as it may, the tradition of the discoveries of this Irish monk kept in mind the possibly existing western land, and issued at last in the discovery of the great continent of America by Columbus. Northumbria Turn now to Northumbria. Adamnan writes that St. Columcille's name was honoured not only in Gaul, Spain, and Italy, but in Rome itself. England, however, owes to it a special veneration because of the widespread apostolic work accomplished within her borders by Columcille's Irish disciples. The facts are as follows. Northumbrian Christianity was well nigh exterminated through the victory of Penda the pagan, over Edwin the Christian, A.D. 633. St. Paulinus, its local Roman apostle, was driven permanently from his newly founded churches. Meanwhile, Oswald and his brother Edwith sought refuge among the Irish monks of Iona and received baptism at their hands. Edwith died and Oswald became heir to the throne. A battle was fought. The day before he met the pagan army between the Tyne and the Solway, Oswald beheld St. Columcille in vision, saying to him, Be strong and of good faith, I will be with thee. The result of this vision of the abbot of Iona was that a considerable part of England received the true faith. Oswald was victorious. He united the kingdoms of Dyra and Bernicia, and became overlord of practically all England, with the exception of Kent. There was an evangelization to be done, and St. Oswald turned to Iona. In response to his appeal, the Irish bishop, St. Aidan, was sent with several companions. They were established on the island of Lindisfarne, in sight of the royal residence at Bambra. These monks laboured in union with, and even seemed to exceed in zeal, the Roman missionaries in the south under St. Augustine. However great the enthusiasm they had displayed for conversions in Iona, they displayed still greater on the desolate island of Lindisfarne. In the first instance, St. Aidan and his monks evangelized Northumbria. Want of facility in preaching in the Anglo-Saxon tongue was at first an obstacle. But it was speedily overcome, for King Oswald himself, who knew both Gaelic and English, came forward and acted as interpreter. When St. Aidan died in 651, Iona sent St. Finnan, another Irish bishop, to succeed him. Finnan spread the faith beyond the borders of Northumbria, and succeeded so well that he himself baptised Penda, king of the Mid-Angles, and Siegbert, 
king of the East Saxons. Dayuma and Kellach, Irish monks, assisted by three Anglo-Saxon disciples of St. Aidan, consolidated the mission to the Mercians. Anglia While Christianity was thus being restored in Northumbria, other Irish apostles were teaching it in East Anglia. St. Fursey, accompanied by his brother St. Voilin and St. Alton, and the priests Gobham and Dickwill, landed in England in 633, and began to labour in the eastern portions of Anglia. In his monastery at Bergcastle in Suffolk, the convert King Siegbert made his monastic profession, and in the same house many heavenly visions were vouchsafed to its founder. The South Saxons had in Dickwill an apostle who founded the monastery of Bosham in Sussex, whence originated the Episcopal See of Chichester. Another Irish monk named Maeldub settled among the West Saxons and became the founder of Malmesbury Abbey and the instructor of the well-known St. Aldham. Thus did Irish monks contribute to the conversion of, of Great Britain and its many distant islands. They built up the faith by their holy lives, their preaching and their enthusiasm, and wisely provided for its perpetuation by educating a native clergy and by the founding of monastic institutions. They were not yet satisfied, so they turned towards other lands to bring to other peoples the glad tidings of salvation. Gaul. In 590, St. Columbanus, a monk of Bangor in Ireland, accompanied by twelve brethren, arrived in France, having passed through Britain. After the example of St. Columcille in Caledonia, they travelled to the court of Gontram, king of Burgundy, in order to secure his help and protection. During the course of the journey they preached to the people, and all were impressed with their modesty, patience, and devotion. At that epoch Gaul was sadly in need of such missionaries, for, owing partly to the invasion of barbarians, and partly to remissness on the part of the clergy, vice and impiety everywhere prevailed. Columbanus, because of his zeal, sanctity, and learning, was well fitted for the task that lay before him. One of his early works in Burgundy was the founding of the monastery of Luxeuil, which became the parent of many other monasteries founded either by himself or by his disciples. Many holy men came from Ireland to join the community, and so numerous did the monks of Luxeuil become that separate choirs were formed to keep up perpetual praise, the Laus Perennis. But Columbanus did not remain at Luxeuil. In his strict, uncompromising preaching he spared not even kings, and he preferred to leave his flourishing monastery rather than pass over in silence the vices of the Merovingians. He escaped from the malice of Brunehaut, and being banished from Burgundy, made his way to Neustria, and thence to Metz. Full of zeal, he resolved to preach the faith to the pagans along the Rhine, and with this purpose set out with a few of his followers. They proceeded as far as the Lake of Zurich, and finally established themselves at Bregenz, on the Lake of Constance. By this time his disciple, St. Gaul, had learned the Alemannian dialect, which enabled him to push forward the work of evangelization. But Columbanus felt that he was called to labour in other lands while vigour remained to him. So, bidding his favourite follower farewell, he crossed the Alps and arrived at Milan in northern Italy. King Agilulf and his queen, Theodolinda, gave the Irish abbot a reverent and kind welcome. His zeal was still unspent, and he worked much for the conversion of the Lombard Arians. Here he founded, between Milan and Genoa, the monastery of Bobbio, which, as a centre of knowledge and piety, was long the light of northern Italy. In this monastery he died in the year 615, but not before the arrival of messengers from King Clothaire, inviting him to return to Luxeuil, as his enemies were now no more. But he could not go. All he asked was protection for his dear monks at Luxeuil. It has been said, most truly, that Ireland never sent a greater son to do God's work in foreign lands 
than Columbanus. The fruit of his labours remained, and for centuries after his death, his influence was widely felt throughout Europe, especially in France and Italy. His zeal for the interests of God was unbounded, and this was the secret of his immense power. Some of his writings have come down to us, and comprise his rule for monks, his penitential, sixteen short sermons, six letters, and several poems, all in Latin. His letters are of much value as evidence of Ireland's ancient belief in papal supremacy. Switzerland Gaul, Columbanus's disciple, remained in Switzerland. In a fertile valley lying between two rivers and surrounded by hills, he laid the beginning of the great abbey which afterwards bore his name and became one of the most famous monasteries in Christendom. St. Gaul spent thirty years of his life in Helvetia, occupying himself in teaching, preaching, and prayer. He succeeded where others had failed, and that which was denied to Columbanus was reserved for Gaul, his disciple, and the latter is entitled the Apostle of Alemania. Other districts had their Irish missionaries and apostles. Not far from St. Gaul, at Seckingen, near Basel, St. Fridolin was a pioneer in the work of evangelization. Towards the close of the 7th century, St. Killian, an Irishman, with his companions, Tottenham and Coleman, arrived in Franconia. He was martyred at Würzburg, where he is honoured as patron and apostle. Sigisbert, another Irish follower of St. Columbanus, spread the faith among the half-pagan people of eastern Helvetia, and founded the monastery of Dissentis in Raetia. St. Ursan, a little town on the boundaries of Switzerland, took its origin from another disciple of St. Columbanus. Other Apostles and Founders Desire for solitary life drew St. Fiacre to a hermitage near Meaux, where he transformed wooded glades into gardens to provide vegetables for poor people. This charity has earned for Fiacre the title of patron saint of gardeners. St. Fersi, the illustrious Apostle of East Anglia, crossed over to France, where he travelled and preached continuously. He built a monastery at lagny sur marne and was about to return to East Anglia when he died at Mezerol, near Doulon. St. Gobham followed his master's example, and like him evangelized and founded monasteries. St. Eto, Zé, acted in like manner. St. Foylan and St. Ulton, brothers of St. Fersi, became apostles in southern Brabant. The monastery of Onau, on an island near Strasbourg, and that of Altomunster in Bavaria, owe their foundation to the Irish monks Tuban and Alto, respectively. Not far from Luxeuil was the Abbey of Lourdes, another great Irish foundation, due to Dei Collis, Dale de Chouille, a brother of St. Gaul and a disciple of St. Columbanus, so important was this house considered in later times that its abbot was numbered among the princes of the Holy Roman Empire. Rouen, in Normandy, felt the influence of the Irish monks through the instrumentality of Saint-Ouen, and the monasteries of Jouard, Roubaix, Jumiège, Le Canal, and saint Vendril were due at least indirectly to Columbanus or his disciples. Turning to Belgium, it is recorded that St. Romold preached the faith in Mechlin, and St. Livinus in Ghent. Both came from Ireland. St. Vigilius, a voluntary exile from Erin, for the love of Christ, established his monastery at Salzburg in Austria. He became bishop there and died in 781. Moreover, the Celtic rule of Columbanus was carried into Picardy by St. Valery, St. Omer, St. Bertin, St. Mummelin, and St. Valdelanus, but the Irish Cadoc and Fricol had already preceded them, their work resulting in the foundation of the Abbey of St. Riquier. Italy. Something yet remains to be said of the monks of Ireland in Italy. Anterior to St. Columbanus's migration, his fellow countryman, St. Frigidian, or Fridian, had taken up his abode in Italy at Montepisana, 
not far from the city of Lucca, where he became famed for sanctity and wisdom. On the death of the Bishop of Lucca, Frigidian was compelled to occupy the vacant see. St. Gregory the Great wrote of him that he was a man of rare virtue. His teachings and holy life not only influenced the lives of his own flock, but brought to the faith many heretics and pagans. In Lucca, this Celtic apostle is still honoured under the name of St. Frediano. St. Pellegrinus is another Irish saint who sought solitude at Garfanana in the Apennines, and Catheldus, a Waterford saint, in 680, became bishop of Taranto, which he governed for many years with zeal and great wisdom. His co-worker was Donatus, his brother, who founded the church at Lecce in the kingdom of Naples. Of the two learned Irishmen, Clemens and Albinus, who resided in France in the 8th century, Albinus was sent into Italy, where at Pavia he was placed at the head of the school attached to St. Augustine's monastery. Dungal, his compatriot, was a famous teacher in the same city. Lothair thus ordained concerning him, We desire that at Pavia and under the superintendence of Dungal, all students should assemble from Milan, Brescia, Lodi, Bergamo, Novara, Vercelli, Tortona, Acqui, Genoa, Asti, Como. It was this same Dungal who presented the Bango Salter to Bobbio. Therefore it may be reasonably conjectured that he came from the very monastery that produced Columbanus, Gaul, and Comgaul. Faisal in Tuscany venerates two Irish 8th century saints, Donatus and Andrew. The former was educated at Iniscaltra, and Andrew was his friend and disciple. After visiting Rome, they lingered at Faisal. Donatus was received with great honour by clergy and people, and was requested to fill their vacant bishopric. With much hesitation he took upon himself the burden which he bore for many years. His biographer says of him that he was liberal in almsgiving, sedulous in watching, devout in prayer, excellent in doctrine, ready in speech, holy in life. Andrew, who was his deacon, founded the church and monastery of St. Martin in Mensola, and is known in Faisal as St. Andrew of Ireland, or St. Andrew the Scot, that is, the Irishman. Hospitalia. Thus Irish monks were to be found in France, Belgium, Switzerland, Germany and Italy, and even in Bulgaria. So numerous were they, and so frequent their travels through the different countries of Europe, that hospices were founded to befriend them. These institutions were known as Hospitalia Scotorum, hospices for the Irish, and their benefactors were not only pious laymen, but the highest ecclesiastical authorities. Sometimes the hospices were diverted to purposes other than those originally intended, and then church councils would intervene in favour of the lawful inheritors. Thus, in 845, we read that the Council of Meaux ordered the hospices of France to be restored to the dispossessed Irishmen. In the 12th century, Ireland still continued to send forth a constant succession of monk pilgrims, renowned for faith, austerity and piety. Ratisbon. Special monasteries were erected to be peopled by the Irish. The most renowned of these dates from 1067, when Marianus Scotus, Marianus the Irishman, with his companions John and Candidus, left his native land and arrived in Bavaria. These holy men were welcomed at Ratisbon by the Bishop Otto, and on the advice of Merturat, an Irish recluse, took up their residence near St. Peter's Church at the outskirts of the city. Novices flocked from Ireland to join them, and a monastery was erected to receive the community. In a short time this had to be replaced by a still larger one, which was known to future ages as the Abbey of St. James's of the Scots, that is, Irish, at Ratisbon. How prolific was this parent foundation is evidenced from its many offshoots, the only surviving monasteries on the continent for many centuries intended for Irish brethren. These, besides St. James's at Erfurt, 
and St. Peter's at Ratisbon, comprised St. James's at Würzburg, St. Giles's at Nuremberg, St. Mary's at Vienna, St. James's at Constance, St. Nicholas's at Memmingen, Holy Cross at Eichstadt, a priory at Kelheim, and another at Oils in Silesia, all of which were founded during the 12th or 13th century, and formed a Benedictine congregation approved of by Pope Innocent III, and presided over by the abbot of Ratisbon. These Irish houses, with their long lines of Celtic abbots, in the days of their prosperity did much work that was excellent and civilising, and rightly deserve a remembrance in the achievements of Ireland's ancient missionaries. Ratisbon and its dependent abbeys, as is set forth in the papal briefs of 1218, possessed priories in Ireland, and from these novices were usually obtained. But evil days came for the congregation of St. James, and now it is extinct. The subjugation of Ireland to England, says Wattenbach, contributed no doubt to the rapid decline of the Stotic, that is, Irish, monasteries. For from Ireland they had up till then been continually receiving fresh supplies of strength. In this their fatherland, the root of their vitality was to be found. Loss of independence involved loss of enterprise. Scholarship and Influence Irish monks were not only apostles of souls, but also masters of intellectual life. Thus, in the 7th century, the Celtic monastery of Luxo became the most celebrated school in Christendom. Monks from other houses and sons of the nobility crowded to it. The latter were clearly not intended for the cloister, but destined for callings in the world. There were outstanding men among these missionaries from Ireland, St. Virgilius of Salzburg in the 8th century taught the sphericity of the earth and the existence of the Antipodes. It was the same teaching that Copernicus and later astronomers formulated into the system now in vogue. St. Columcille himself was a composer of Latin hymns and a penman of no mean order, as the Book of Kells, if written by him, sufficiently proves. In all the monasteries which he founded, provision was made for the pursuit of sacred learning and the multiplication of books by transcription. The students of his schools were taught classics, mechanical arts, law, history and physics. They improved the methods of husbandry and gardening, supplied the people whom they helped to civilise with implements of labour and taught them the use of the forge, an accomplishment belonging to almost every Irish monk. The writings of Adamnan, who spent most of his life outside his native land, show that he was familiar with the best Latin authors, and had a knowledge of Greek as well. His Vita es Columbi, Life of St. Columcille, has made his name immortal as a Latin writer. His book De Locis Sanctis, On the Holy Places, contains information he received from the pilgrim bishop Arculfus, who had been driven by a tempest to take refuge with the monks of Iona. On account of the importance of the writings of Adamnan, and because of his influence in secular and ecclesiastical affairs of importance, few will question his right to a distinguished place among the saintly scholars of the West. Irish monks, abroad as well as at home, were pre-eminently students and exponents of Holy Scripture. Sedulius wrote a commentary on the Epistles of St. Paul. John Scotus Eregena composed a work, De Praedestinatione, concerning predestination. Dungall was not only an astronomer, but also an excellent theologian, as is clear from his defence of Catholic teaching on the invocation of saints and the veneration of their relics. His knowledge of sacred scripture and of the fathers is exceedingly remarkable. St. Columbanus, besides other works, is said to have composed an exposition of the Psalms, which is mentioned in the catalogue of St. Gaul's library, but which cannot now be identified with certainty. The writings of this abbot are said to have brought about a more frequent use of confession both in the world and in monasteries, 
and his legislation regarding the blessed sacrament fostered eucharistic devotion marianus scotus is the author of a commentary on the psalms so precious that rarely was it allowed to pass beyond the walls of the monastic library his commentary on st paul's epistles is regarded as his most famous production herein he shows acquaintance with saints jerome augustine gregory and leo with cassiodorus oregon alcuin cassian and peter the deacon he completed the work on the seventeenth of may ten seventy nine and ends the volume by asking the reader to pray for the salvation of his soul transcription in all the monasteries a vast number of scribes were continually employed in multiplying copies of the sacred scriptures these masterpieces of calligraphy written by irish hands have been scattered throughout the libraries of europe and many fragments remain to the present day the beauty of these manuscripts is praised by all and the names of the best transcribers often find mention in monastic annals the work was irksome but it was looked upon as a privilege and meritorious it remains to speak of that glorious monument of the irish monks the abbey of st gall in switzerland it was here that celtic influence was most felt and endured the longest within its walls for centuries the sacred sciences were taught and classic authors studied many of its monks excelled as musicians and poets while others were noted for their skill in calligraphy and the fine arts the library was only in its infancy in the eighth century but gradually it grew and eventually became one of the largest and richest in the world the brethren were in correspondence with all the learned houses of france and italy and there was constant mutual interchange of books sacred and scientific between them they manufactured their own parchment from the hides of the wild beasts that roamed in the forests around them and bound their books in boards of wood clamped with iron or ivory such was the monastery of st gall which owes its inception to the journey through europe of the great columbanus and his monk companions men whose lives according to bede procured for the religious habit great veneration so that wherever they appeared they were received with joy as god's own servants and what will be the reward asked the biographer of marianus scotus of these pilgrim monks who left the sweet soil of their native land its mountains and hills its valleys and its groves its rivers and pure fountains and went like the children of abraham without hesitation into the land which god had pointed out to them he answers thus they will dwell in the house of the lord with the angels and archangels of god for ever they will behold the god of gods in sion to whom be honour and glory for ever and ever references lanagan ecclesiastical history of ireland dublin eighteen twenty nine montalembert monks of the west edinburgh eighteen sixty one moran irish saints in great britain dublin nineteen o three dalgairns apostles of europe london eighteen seventy six healy ireland's ancient schools and scholars dublin eighteen ninety barrett a calendar of scottish saints fort augustus nineteen o four stokes six months in the apennines london eighteen ninety two three months in the forest of france london eighteen ninety five fowler vita s columbi oxford eighteen ninety four wattenbach articles in ulster journal of archaeology volume seven belfast eighteen fifty nine google les chrétiennes celtiques paris nineteen eleven hogan articles in irish ecclesiastical record eighteen ninety four eighteen ninety five drain christian schools and scholars london eighteen eighty one end of section three Section 4 of 
the glories of ireland this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org reading by matt Perard. the glories of ireland edited by joseph dunn and p j lennox the irish and the sea by william h babcock l l b the beginning of irish navigation like the beginning of everything else is hidden in the mist of antiquity vessels of some kind obviously must have borne the successive waves of immigrants or invaders to the island naturally they would remain in use afterwards for trade travel exploration and war irish ships may have been among those of the breton fleet that caesar dispersed at van after an obstinate struggle two or three centuries later we find Njal of the nine hostages making nautical descents on the neighboring shores especially britain and there is every probability that ships of the island conveyed some at least of the scots irish whom gildas in the sixth century describes as joining the picts and furiously storming the roman wall the the equally adventurous but more pacific work of exploration went on also if we may judge by that extraordinary series of irish sea sagas the imirama comprising the voyages of bran Meldwin, the we cora and st brendan the last mentioned deservedly the most famous these vary in their literary merits and in the merits of their several parts for they have been successfully rewritten at different periods receiving always something of the colour belief and adornment which belong to the writer's time but under all may be dimly traced as in a palimpsest the remote pagan original at their best they embody a lofty and touching poetry very subtle and significant as when we read of brand's summoning by a visitant of supernatural beauty to the isles of undying delight where a thousand years are but as a day his return with a companion who had been overcome by longing for ireland and home the man's falling to ashes at the first touch of the native soil as though he had been long dead and the flight of bran and his crew from the real living world to the islands of the blessed at least equally fine and stirring is st brendan's interview with the exiled spirit of heaven whose sin was but little so that he and his fellows were given only the pleasing penance of singing delightfully in the guise of beautiful birds the praises of the god who showed them mercy and grace amid the charms of an earthly paradise then all the birds sang evensong so that it was an heavenly noise to hear it is not very surprising that st brendan's legend with such qualities in prose and verse made itself at home in many lands and languages and became for centuries a widespread popular favorite and matter of general belief also influencing the most permanent literature of a high contemplative caste which we may suppose to be out of touch with it altogether certain of its more unusual incidents are found even in arab writings of romance founded on fact as in edrisi's narrative of the magrurin explorers of lisbon and the adventures of sinbad related in the arabian nights but perhaps here we have a case of reciprocal borrowing such as may well occur when ships companies of different nations meet the most conspicuous insistent and repeated feature of all these imrama is a belief in atlantic islands fair enough or wonderful enough to tempt the shore dwellers of ireland far away and hold them spellbound for years it is easy to ascribe these pictures to sunset on the ocean or the wonders of mirage but all the time within long sailing distance there actually were islands of delightful climate and exceeding beauty these had been occasionally reached from the mediterranean ever since early carthaginian times as classical authors seem to tell us 
why not also from ireland perhaps not quite so distant it is undoubted that the canary islands were never really altogether forgotten and the same is probably true of the madeiras and all three groups of azores though the knowledge that lingered in ireland was a distorted glimmering tradition of old voyages occasionally inciting to new ventures in the same field some have supposed though without sufficient evidence that st brendan even made his way to america and parts of that shoreline in several different latitudes have been selected as the scene of the exploit his first entry into serious geography is in the fine maps of dulcer thirteen thirty nine and the pizigani thirteen sixty seven both of which plainly label madeira porto santo and las desertas the fortunate islands of st brandon that there may be no possibility of misunderstanding the pisigani brothers present a full-length portrait of the holy navigator himself bending over these islands with hands of benediction the inscription though not the picture was common thus applied on the maps of the next century or two and no other interpretation of his voyage found any place until a later time of course the fourteenth century was a long way from the sixth when the voyage was supposed to have been made and we cannot take so late a verdict as convincing proof of any fact but it at least exhibits the current interpretation of the written narrative among geographers and mariners the people best able to judge and here the interval was much less the story itself seems to corroborate them in a general way if read naturally one would say that it tells of a voyage to the canaries of which one is unmistakably the island under mount atlas and that this was undertaken by way of the azores and madeira with inevitable experience of great beauty in some islands and volcanic terrors in others madeira may well have been pitched upon by the interpreters as the suitable scene of a particularly long tarrying by the way of course magic filled out all gaps of real knowledge and wonders grew with each new rewriting whatever brendan did there is no doubt that irish mariner monks incited by the great awakening which followed st patrick's mission covered many seas in their frail vessels during the next three or four centuries they set up a flourishing religious establishment in orkney made stepping-stones of the intervening islands and reached iceland some time in the eighth century if not earlier the norsemen following in their tracks as always found them there and the earliest icelandic writings record their departure leaving behind them books bells and other souvenirs on an islet offshore which still bears their name did they keep before the norsemen to america too at least the norsemen thought so for centuries the name great ireland or white men's land was accepted in norse geography as meaning a region far west of ireland a parallel to great sweden russia which lay far east of sweden the saga of karsefni first to attempt colonizing america makes it plain that his followers believed great ireland to be somewhere in that region and it is explicitly located near wineland by the twelfth century lanlamapa also there were specific tales afloat of a distinguished icelander lost at sea who was afterward found in a western region by an irish vessel long driven before the storm the version most relied on came through one ruffin who had dwelt in limerick also through thorfinn earl of the orkneys brazil the old irish brazil was another name for land west of ireland where there is none short of america on very many medieval maps of which perhaps a dozen are older than the year fourteen hundred the earliest yet found being that of del orto thirteen twenty five usually it appears as a nearly circular disk of land opposite munster 
at first altogether too near the irish coast as indeed the perfectly well-known corvo was drawn much too near the coast of spain or as even in the sixteenth century when newfoundland had been repeatedly visited that island was shifted by diverse map-makers eastward towards ireland almost to the conventional station of brazil also not long afterwards the maps of nicolay and Saltieri adopted the reverse treatment of transferring brazil to newfoundland waters as if recognizing past error and restoring its proper place the name brazil appears not to have been adopted by the norsemen but there is one fifteenth-century map perhaps at fourteen eighty preserved in milan which shows this large disc-form brazil just below greenland ila verde in such relation that the map-maker really must have known of labrador under the former name and believed that it could be readily reached from that norse colony it seems altogether likely that brazil was applied to the entire outjutting region of america surrounding the gulf of st lawrence that part of this continent which is by far the nearest ireland besides the facts above stated certain coincidences of real geography and of these old maps favor that belief and they are quite unlikely to have been guessed or invented thus certain maps beginning with thirteen seventy five while keeping the circular external outline of ireland reduced the land area to a mere ring enclosing an expanse of water dotted with islands and certain other maps show it still nearly circular externally and solid but divided into two parts by a curved channel nearly from north to south the former exposition is possible enough to one more concerned with the nearly enclosed gulf of st lawrence and its islands than with its two comparatively narrow outlets the second was afterward repeated approximately by gastoldi's map illustrating ramuzio when he was somehow moved to minimize the width of the gulf though well remembering the straits of belle isle and cabot there are some other coincidences but it is unnecessary to dwell on them land west of ireland must be either pure fancy or the very region in question and it is hardly believable that fancy could guess so accurately as to two different interpretations of real though unusual geography and give them right latitude which with such an old irish name brazil as might naturally have been conferred in the early voyaging times that an extensive region chiefly mainland should be represented as an island is no objection as any one will see by examining the maps which break up everything north of south america in the years next following the achievements of columbus and cabot there was a natural tendency to expect nothing but islands short of asia it seems likely therefore that america was actually reached by the irish even before the norsemen and certainly long before all other europeans references babcock early norse visits to north america smithsonian publication two one three eight nineteen thirteen baring gould curious myths of the middle ages Beauvoir, the discovery of the new world by the irish cantwell pre-columbian discoveries of america daily the legend of st brandon celtic review volume one a sequel to the voyage of st brandon celtic review january thirteenth nineteen o nine hardiman the history of galway hull irish episodes of icelandic history joyce the voyage of melduin nut the voyage of Brun, stokes the voyage of maldwin review celtique volume nine voyage of snedgus review celtique volume nine voyage of the we cora review celtique volume fourteen moran brendan End of section four